<laughs> Hopefully you've been scanned as well. Uh, if you haven't been scanned, uh, just just give us a nod and we will uh, scan you. The reason for doing that is just so you can get the presentation afterwards uh, and uh, you'll have our details so obviously you can follow up. Right, okay, I'm going to stop rabbiting on. Um, we are here, we've got Jo Meehan who is the Professor of Responsible Procurement at the University of Liverpool. She's going to give us a, uh, hopefully, really interesting talk, possibly provocative I'm told as well, uh, about social value and procurement. Uh, for me, it's going to be a really interesting subject, hopefully learn something a little bit about taking social value beyond just a checkbox, uh, tick box exercise. So I'm going to stop talking and hand over to Joe, and we'll field some questions oh, at the end. So um, please do ask Joe what uh, anything you like relevant to the topic. Hello, hello. Can you all hear me? Yes. I'm just making sure it's not actually a silent disco and you're all just listening to music. Um, so thank you for coming to hear me. Sorry, I've got a bit of a croaky voice. Um, Hopefully I won't cough too much into your ears. I'll try not to, I'll try, hold off on the coughing. So I'm going to talk to you today about social value in procurement, but first a little bit about me. And um, for those of you who don't know me, so I'm Jo Meehan. I work at the University of Liverpool Management School and I have a background in procurement. So because, before I came over to academia, I was a, a buyer for ICI, a big chemical company in, in Runcorn for about 11 years and then I moved over, did a PhD in procurement and I've been talking about procurement, researching procurement for about three decades. Um, so I'm feeling very old um, and very croaky. Um, but I want to share to, with you today some of the work we've been doing around social value. So I also need to point out my title. So Professor of Responsible for Procurement. So for me, when you get to be a professor, you can choose your title. So most people would say professor of procurement, but I wanted responsible in there because I think it's really important that we make that distinction. Anybody can buy stuff, but it's much more difficult to buy stuff responsibly and to buy stuff well. And I'm particularly interested in um, social value. I do work on modern slavery and I do work on sustainability. And I also head up a research center at the University of Liverpool um, the Centre for Sustainable Business. But it's social value I want to talk to you about today. And the title, It's About Time. It is about time we started doing social value well. So yes, it's been around for a while, particularly in social housing. We started to do social value before there was the Public Services Act. We, we're, we're well versed in what social value is. Um, but the time element is often overlooked. We don't often think about the long-term issues that sit within social value. And hopefully that, you can see that okay. So there's a shift towards reporting outcomes rather than outputs in procurement contracts. And I think we all recognise that. There's been this movement to say, let's move away from outputs. Let's really focus on social value outcomes. And intuitively, we all know that's a good thing to do. Yes, we need to think about outcomes rather than just outputs. The problem, though, that we're finding through our research is that counterintuitively, that raises some real problems when we start looking for outcomes within procurement contracts. And the reason it's difficult within procurement contracts is because the time frames don't match. So social issues are multi-generational, very complex, lots of issues going on around why certain communities are disadvantaged or don't have access to opportunity in the same way. And the idea that it can be solved within a procurement contract is a little bit naive. And it also creates some real problems for our market, which I'm going to look at in a second. And the reason for this graphic is we're starting to see massive market concentration in our supply markets. So the big companies are getting really big and dominating that supply landscape and it's getting ever harder for small businesses to operate in that environment. And partly that's because the way social value is playing out. Other factors as well, but social value is falling into the same trap. So when we think about time, as I said, the title of this presentation was It's About Time. And we need to start thinking about time and time frames. So short term versus longer term. And as I said earlier, social issues are generational 
and stem from multiple underinvestments. It's not just one thing. It's not because they haven't had a fence painted or because they haven't got a football pitch in their community. It's so much deeper than that. It's levels upon levels of deprivation. We've had austerity. We have had removal of many of the services from particular communities, lack of infrastructure, lack of access to opportunity. All of these things are really deep rooted. Contracts by contrast, even on long term contracts, are only like three, four, five years t term. We're never going to get to those deeper issues in that time frame. <clears throat> So activities within contracts are inherently time-bound and transient. We can't solve some of these social value issues within a contract. And measuring outcomes at a contract level can obscure problems of displacement. Now this is not saying we shouldn't measure outcomes, but what our research is showing is we shouldn't measure outcomes within contracts. It's, it takes us in the wrong direction, and I'll explain some of that a little bit more later. But by measuring outcomes in a contract, we're trying to cram everything in and we start to create some false narratives about our role and supplier's role in, in addressing some social issues. And the problems of displacement means we focus on the things we've done rather than some of the net effects that our communities face. So we might say, we've taken on five apprenticeships which is great, we've taken on five apprenticeships. But when we start to look at it, they're often in construction, young men. And they're often people who probably would have got a contract anyway, probably would have got employment. We're not getting to those people who fall outside of those boundaries. So what about women? What about older people? What about people who don't want to go into construction? There's a displacement effect. And yes, the good is good, but we need to look at it in the round. We can't just look at the goals we've scored, we need to look at the goals we've conceded as well. Because that gives us a true reflection of the social issues in our community. So how and when social value is measured and by whom has lasting impacts on community? And we need to think about who is doing the measurement of social value. Who is telling us what our success is and what our measures of success are. And largely they are suppliers, private sector, profit driven suppliers. Now that's not saying that these companies are bad or they've got bad people in them, but it, they, we start to see this movement from local authorities being responsible for social outcomes, pushing it down to private sector suppliers who may be concerned with different issues. They may not have the long term um, motivation to work the way a local authority should. And what we're starting to see in social value measures, because everybody's talking about outcomes, there's been another knock-on effect of that. And the other knock-on effect is that we're starting to see stories and narratives as a new form of expressing our success. And we're using stories and narratives to win contracts. So suppliers are writing these stories to say, look at the impact we have had. All nice, they're good, they help us to connect, they're emotional, they humanise some of the work we've been doing. So stories and narratives are really good. But when you start to look a little bit deeper, we start to question whose stories are being told and also whose stories aren't being told. We have this, again, this exclusion effect we start to tell the stories of those people who fit the mould, who have done well, and have seen this measure of usually financial success. All those other stories are equally valid, but they don't get voice. And they don't get voice because they don't fit the mould of a private sector company, financially driven, telling a financially based story of what they did to deliver that. But those stories matter. They matter to those communities. If you're one of those people whose story never gets told, you never get access to, to giving your voice and giving your experience from your perspective, all that does, it can in further embed exclusion and thinking I'm not worthy and it, this isn't for me. So we need to start thinking about how we use stories as procurement people 
to, yes, they can humanise, they can give life to what we've done, but how do we start to get a more honest view about the community's stories and what stories they would like to tell? Sorry, that's um, not what he said. You can put five people into employment, but it's the stories behind them. That's, that was the quote from one of our pieces of research. And the reason why this, it's not a rude emoji, um, this is about cherry picking. Um, and what happens when companies start to use stories and narratives to win work around social value is that they cherry pick the stories. And they, they position them in such a way that none of this work would have happened if it wasn't for us. And often it would have happened anyway. Some of these outcomes would have happened with or without that particular supplier. So they're not very good in terms of having dis discriminatory effect. They don't discriminate good suppliers from, from worse suppliers or better suppliers. And here's an example of the implied causality in chronological stories. So this was a typical example from our, our research. Sorry if you can't see that very well, I'll read it out. We were working with a lad who was a neat. He joined our shared apprenticeship scheme. He got some work experience. He's now got a job as a grounds worker. We set that up and if it hadn't have happened, then he wouldn't have got that. And when we write stories, we are always the hero in our own story. Um, the supplier in this case is its own hero. We've come along, you know, forget that there was multiple levels of deprivation in this community. We come along with an apprenticeship scheme. One person has got a job. Hey ho, poverty solved. And it's just not that simple. And interestingly, when you start looking at stories, there's an implied causality. You know, what they did. And they also determine the start, the middle and the end of the story. Now, if this was any community that I'm familiar with, this probably isn't the start of the story. The start of the story will go back much further than that. And it might not be from that particular starting point. The end point isn't that end point either. The end point is, you know, go back in five, ten years. What happened to these communities? Is the community now all sorted? We don't have these problems anymore. What happened to this lad? Is he still a grounds worker? Or did he have some, um, some new opportunities that opened up to him? What happened to him? What happened to his family? What happened to his life chances? So when we start to have stories, we, they're open to distortion. They're open to um, contestation by different stakeholders. It doesn't mean the story's false. That story is true. But the start, the middle and the end, and the supplier being the hero, is up for debate whether that's actually true. And the problem with stories is that they confer legitimacy. We're human beings, we like connection, they, they create emotion. We can connect to those stories and go, oh, that's a good thing. Yeah, through our procurement, somebody's got a job, nice, we've, we've helped somebody. They make us feel good. But they also confer legitimacy. And legitimacy is where we don't question something. We take it as read that this is fact. And they may be factually correct, but they may also not be the start, the middle and the end. And we believe the stories were told because they are factually correct, but they, they distort reality. When we're looking at procurement contracts, the stories that are told to win work reflect past performance. So past performance that a supplier has done in a particular community, and we use that to infer what they may do in the future. But the future may be in a different community, it may have different needs, it may have different people involved, it may not have the same amount of access. So we can't assume that the future will be delivered in the same way that this past story has. But we use that to make decisions in the present. So I'm not saying stories aren't good, but as procurement people we need to be a bit more savvy in thinking about what is the role of these stories, how cherry-picked are they, and whose stories are being told. So 
could we get new stories from the community? What stories would they like us to, to tell from their perspective, from their lived experience? So I am an academic now, um, so a little bit of theory. So a little bit of agency theory. So agency theory, I'm not going to bore you with, with theories, honestly. Theory is useful as academics because it helps us to explain things. It has prediction, predictory powers. We can predict what will happen in any situation using theory. And agency theory is one of the best known theories for purchasing, supply and procurement. And in essence, a buyer acts as a principal, contracts with a supplier who's the agent and they trade goods for money or goods or services for money. That's agency theory in, in its broadest sense. But what agency theory predicts is that that buying organisation and that selling organisation will have different priorities, different incentives, different motives, different tensions, different conflicting masters. Therefore, we will never get a fully optimal solution in that contract because we're all trying to keep a little bit for ourselves. And it predicts that in any contract there will be some what's called agency loss. And that usually means loss to the buying organisation because they could have got a better deal, they could have got a better price, they could have got better outcomes. There's always some bit of residual loss through any contract that we see. And we've used agency theory in our most recent research to try to figure out why social value often doesn't work and why sometimes it does. Why is that? What, what's going on beneath the surface? And we've come up with this idea of instrumental versus integrated social value. So instrumental social value is a classification of organisations where they are driven just by money. So they're financially orientated, That's, they can care about the other things, but their primary purpose is financial, to make, to make money or to save money in the buyer's case. So they're very financially orientated. They tend to operate more on the short term, so targets, financial cycles. And it's not that they don't care about sustainability or social value, but they will make a business case for it because fin financials have primacy. Versus integrated social value organisations. So integrated social value organisations are where profit's still important, but is put on a level with other social issues and environmental issues. And almost all three need to be satisfied. You know, so we're not just gonna take contracts for any, you know, at any cost. We want to make sure that we are doing social good or environmental regeneration or whatever it is alongside it. They tend to take more longer term decisions, so they see things more in the round. It can still have different tensions because they're still trying to marry those three up. But the way social value is operationalised through those contracts is different, depending on the culture in that organisation. So it affects timeframes. Instrumental, short term time frame, integrated, much more long term. Priorities, financial versus socio-economic. The tensions start to come up, you know, how do we satisfy these things? Value appropriation is who takes the value. So in a financially driven organisation, it's about what's in it for me. So do I get sufficient value share? In an integrated organisation, you, so, you think more about who benefits and it's often beyond just the buyer and seller, it's the community. So we're, we're balancing some of those value um, appropriations. <coughs> and I can't, sorry for coughing in your ears then. Um, contracts will look very different in, in those types of organisations. And not yet published, but will be soon. So Claire Westcott is one of our PhD students. And she, interestingly, she's a chartered accountant by background. And she's doing like a third career now with us doing a PhD. And it's interesting to have um, a very financially orientated person doing a PhD on social value in public procurement. I feel like I've had a win that I've converted her. Um, but what she's been looking at, she's been looking at all these organisations of where social value has been in contracts, when it works and when it doesn't. And 
what's interesting is not whether your, your organisation sees social value as instrumental or integrated. The interesting thing is when the buyer and seller come together with potentially competing logics behind them. So this first one here, transactional, is when the buyer and the seller are both mostly concerned about cost. So supplier wants to make more money, the buyer wants to reduce some costs. When we get those two financially orientated organisations together, we have a minimal delivery, but it meets contract requirements. Nothing great, but it meets requirements. The interesting one is asymmetric, and this was the most common as well. So this is when the buying organisation, so in our case mostly local authorities, were quite financially driven. They just wanted a cheaper price, but our supplier was interested in social value, wanted to do good things in their communities. So they were much more integrated. And the buyer was saying, we just want to push this to the suppliers because they know how to do this really well. And the consequences of that is we started to see real problems over time. The smaller companies particularly are leaving the supply market, going back to that issue about market concentration. Because what's happening, they're having to absorb all the cost of doing social value. It essentially becomes a tax on the supplier. And that's not what the Social Value Act was set up to do. It was supposed to create additional value. But suppliers are saying, you want a cheap price and you want us to do all this stuff as well. So do you know what? We'll finish this contract and we're leaving this, this market. So the, the market is getting smaller and smaller <coughs> and knowledge isn't transferred. So the buyer gets no better at it and it just churns through suppliers and eats them up and eventually we'll be left with, with no market. Constrained is when the buyer and seller are both integrated. So on paper, this looks really good, but they're constrained by their own organisation. So policies aren't aligned, practices aren't aligned. They've got reporting cycles that really don't allow for long-term decisions. So the buyer and seller are really trying to do the right thing and largely are, but their organisations are preventing some of this value to be delivered. And this just is really frustrating. You're trying to do it and your organisation just doesn't help you for you know, policy, bureaucratic reasons. The other really interesting, we found a few what we've called progressive contracts. And these were really small, there weren't many of them. These were the exception. And this is when the buyer and seller both had this integrated view about socio-economic um, view of social value. And they co-produced what was important prior to contract, within contract and after the contract. So they're stretching those timelines. And what happened in each of these cases, there was agency gain. So rather than this loss, this suboptimal, we saw super optimal outcomes. And the, the value was to communities. So this is what social value should be. And we saw knowledge sharing, we saw, saw communities being involved, and the buyer was almost taking this step back saying, we will look at outcomes. We will look at all these contracts that sit under it. We will pull this data together and we will focus on key priorities and work with suppliers to say, in this particular community, the big issue is whether it's access to education and skills or homelessness or whatever the, the issue might be. And we will work with them to figure out how they can contribute to this meaningfully without it just being a tax on the supplier. So, conscious of time, in conclusion, one of the things that we're seeing needs to happen to get this agency gain, to get this gain to communities, is that we need to shift accountability for outcomes. So this idea that we will put outcomes within contracts is really problematic. Because there isn't enough time to get an outcome, and it leads to us focusing on stories that in and of themselves sound lovely and fluffy, but aren't never getting to the, the nub of these systemic inequalities in our system. To get to the systemic inequalities, we need the local authorities or whoever the public authority is to take control of outcomes. 
they need to do that. They need to look at displacement. So what's the overall cost to our communities? Not just the gains we've got, but what are the, where are the goals, where are we conceding goals as well, as well as scoring goals? We need to work with suppliers to design things that are in the supplier's best interest so they can appropriate some value, but also are in our community's best interest so some value goes to them as well. So we need to have this co-production of a sensible conversation about what can be delivered and what can't be delivered. And we do still need stories, but the stories need to change. The stories shouldn't be coming from our suppliers necessarily. Remember, we're all heroes in our own story. The stories need to come from our communities and they need to be told, we need to listen to what they're telling us. They need to tell us what the story should be, what the start, the middle and the end is. And we need to encourage a more inclusive view of storytelling that our communities own. They can tell us where our priorities should be. And that's it from me. Any questions? Thanks, Joe. Uh, right. That was, uh, I know I've got, I've got questions, but uh, see your hand up. If you've got a question, I'll come to you with a mic and uh, everyone will be able to hear your question. Well, Joe particularly. Uh, go, I'll, kick, I'll kick off. Uh, as a buyer, if I was head of procurement, what would I be doing today? I mean, I think you talked about policy and procedure and things. Practically, if, if, uh, if a procurement organisation actually wanted to shift to outcomes, and actually start to think about changing communities. What could they do today to start that ball rolling? I know certainly within their own organisation, not necessarily engaging with suppliers at this point, but what, what would they do? Yeah, so there's into, oh, this is really weird, isn't it? Oh, I don't like it. You can take it off, you don't need to listen to yourself. Okay, yeah, I don't like that at all. Um, yeah, listen, listen to the questions. Um, so internally and externally there's things that buyers can do so it depends how much influence you've got but what we're trying to get to here we're trying to avoid this so when we're just financially orientated it's it's it really has negative consequences as a buyer if our supplier is integrated so this mismatch this asymmetric coming together is the problem it's actually better if you are financially orientated to find suppliers that already are as well who don't really care that much about social value, that actually gives us a better outcome than that, which is all counterintuitive, but that's what the evidence says. So it's about understanding your own organisations, figuring out are you really financially orientated, cost orientated, which many local authorities are, just because of cost pressures and austerity and all those things. It's not, it's not a judgement call, it's knowing where you are. And if that's what you are, figuring out how you can get around it, that weirdly is better than that. And that's not saying we, do, we don't do social value. It just means we don't necessarily do it in this way where we push it all to suppliers and it becomes a supplier tax. We need to find a better way to do it. Ultimately, what we want to get to is up here. But if you find you're here, there's lots of internal work to do about highlighting what are those conflicting masters that are creating barriers for real social delivery in our communities. We need to move to integrated way of thinking and that is going to come whether you like it or not. Um, that's the direction of travel. You know, the world is on fire, climate emergency, social inequality. We have to change the way we do business. So that is coming and it's figuring out what does that mean for procurement? How do we make sure the rest of our organisation understands that? then how do we work with our supply base to communicate that rather than saying you must do xyz it needs to be much more of a what do we do as a, as a community and do you think that the sorry sorry do you think the procurement act is going to help drive some of that change in terms of move to the most economically away from most economically advantageous tender God, I can't get the word out uh, but also the the broadening of the things that can be included uh, in your Yeah, I'm, I'm really cynical. Um, I don't, as much as the Procurement Act gets lots of attention and it's very big, it's very important, I actually don't think it will have much more of a transformative effect than people think. Um, we could buy that way already if we wanted to and, and, we, and we don't. I just don't see that change happening. Um, 
Hopefully, as from next week, things will get a bit better. The adults might be in charge for a while, but sorry for being political. But even the best will in the world, authorities are just so strap cashed at the moment. We are, even though we want to be socially responsible and we know that's in our long term interest, the reality is we haven't got any money and we're, we are looking at every pound, shilling and pence. Um, so I, I don't think the Procurement Act will have that much of a problem and when it talks about you know, additional transparency, one we haven't got the time to be going around doing all this transparency stuff and holding companies to account. Um, I think it will just become another exercise in arse covering. Um, if people can now see some of our things, make sure everything's battened down. I think that might add to more bureaucracy than not. But maybe I'm just being really cynical. No, I think that's fair. Yes, yes. Ooh. Wait for you to put your headphones on. There you go. Um, so I'm from the side of the supplier that is, we basically offer social value. It's a property guardianship company that if you are one of our guardians, you have to commit to X amount of volunteering. And I'm on the side where I'm basically bidding for work. And the thing that I'm struggling with at the minute is internally, we've hit a point of, I think the company's been around since 2011, so it's got some years on it. But internally, because of what you've said about local authorities just only being focused on financials, we're looking in order to kind of exist, do we start to actually not keep coming with social value as number one, but government's social value number two and financial savings is number one. And at the minute, it's really interesting because we're having a massive kind of 50-50 split across the organization of how do we secure the future of the organization? Do we kind of chuck our morals behind us a little bit and lead from a finance side? Or do we continue doing the good work? And it's just a bit yeah. of a cross. Do you have any opinions on I that? I would say, please don't stop doing the social value <laughs> stuff. It's really, really important. Um, it's tempting to just fall into this, go, oh, sod it, I was going to swear, really swear then. Sod it, we'll just go into very financial. That is a backward step though, that is where we need to be getting to. Um, it might be a way of how do, you, how do you bridge into some of those conversations. So the impacts of our procurement has wide ranging effects for our medium long term. So we create more problems for the future. So. It might be a way for yourselves to figure out how do you sell what you're doing now or will have this future impact because organizations will have to get to this. Um, but yeah, don't, don't lose the social value. Please don't lose purpose. We need more of them. Um, but recognize that your, your buying organization might be coming from a different place and figure out what that might mean for you and what your service is that you offer. So you need to find things that bridge into those conversations around cost. So you may, may do things differently, but also tap into the timeline to say, this creates some long-term savings for you, or potentially does. Great, thanks Joe. Uh, anyone else? Oh yes, right. I'm gonna do me challenge Annick a bit of, uh, yeah. I'm gonna jog. Uh, here we go. Hi, thanks, this was really useful. Um, I'm from Winchester City Council, and perhaps the opposite of the lady that's just spoken. It's quite difficult because as, um, sorry your name is, but um, as he suggested that basically most local authorities are after meet and it's very difficult internally to persuade those that decide it that it is of social and quality values first. And so if, if we had some more feedback from providers or those delivering to align our thinking to theirs or evidence or data that stipulates that social value actually gets you that much further ahead, it makes our arguments internally that much easier. Um, and it's also a case of at what point do frameworks start making social value just as high up. So when you enter a framework, you know that you might still be going on a meet basis, but the fundamental social values are ingrained within that framework. Yeah, uh, I think one of the problems that we see is we see each procurement often as a, the next procurement that we're doing. That, that, that's what we're focused on. And I think where we need to get to is organisations need to almost elevate up to a higher level to look at this whole ecosystem 
of harm that's happening in our communities and social inequalities and, and sustainability and all these other issues and figure out what this ecosystem of impact looks like and what our role is in it. And if we, if we sort of map out those, those impacts that if we just take the short term here and the short term here and the short term here, yes, we're getting through and surviving, but we're doing more harm in the, in the long run. And we all know that intuitively, it's nothing new, but we need to find a way to evidence that, to say, if we did procurement differently now, it will help us. So it's that old saying, you know, what's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. You know, what's the second best time to plant a tree? Today. So it's like, we need to do something that, that future proofs where we are. And I recognise that's really, really difficult when we are really cash constrained. Um, Cases, stories can help there, but we need the stories not just from the, we've put somebody in an apprenticeship and then they've, they've got a job and hey ho, the world's great. We need the stories from communities who've got lived experience to go, do you know what? This is really crap where we are. These are the problems we are experiencing every day and figuring out how we can contribute to what's the underlying issue there that we can possibly leave it and have an influence on. Um, and ha so Manchester is a good example, you know, they, they've, they've taken that wider view and tried to get many of the local authorities working together and public sector and private sector on a specific issue that's got a deeper leverage point. Um, so th there are some good examples around of where we've seen that shift and it, but it, the payoff is in the future and that's the bit we need to get over. But when we're this very instrumental view, we only ever not look to the next reporting cycle, the next budgetary cycle. I think from my perspective as well, Joe, it, I don't know what you think, but actually, based on your question, talking to suppliers as well, having that engagement with your key business critical suppliers around, like you said, what do you do? How do you do it? What are your priorities? What are your, it almost gets you to that point of understanding whether you're transactional, asymmetrical or, or, or having that. So I think for me, if you, if you wanted to start this journey, what I'm hearing loud and clear is actually a conversation with suppliers is going to be really useful in terms of setting that as is today and where you want to get in the future, if that's fair. Right, okay, any more questions? I did see someone else that stuck their hand up. Hi, Jerry. Hi. Um, I work for Stockport Homes. Um, I would say we come, we, we would put ourselves as quite an integrated organisation. Um, I'm finding it's the larger contractors that are bidding for work that are very much more along their social value journey and are, are far more integrated but the more local suppliers which is, is yeah. better for us the smaller small medium organizations um, small medium enterprises are less along that journey but probably because they're a small local organization might actually end up being better for us in the long run but when we're actually scoring that procurement yeah in on paper they they're further behind so how do we square that circle i suppose um, yeah that that is difficult um because it's a commercial process it needs to be above board so you've got all those those things and um, the usual bits about you know how do we educate suppliers do these suppliers want to be in our our supply chains how do we find SME friendly ways to do that. Um, we need to look at structures in our supply chains. Um, so it might be that we, we pull things off and categorise them in a slightly different way to give that some of those small companies um, some hope that they can bid. And we need some support. And I think the Procurement Act might help us there. We're going to have some streamlined um, approaches to how we how, how small businesses engage. But often small businesses are saying to us, we don't really want to work with with public sector because they've got a bad rap of, they ask too much of us, they want us to do all this stuff and then do the social value. And some of it is thinking about how do we, the social value, I know we're not supposed to say this, but the social value is sometimes in dealing with small businesses, that is the social value. And I know you can't score that, um, but that is our social value. Um, so. There's an organisational decision there around how do we not ask more of our suppliers, we just want to, to use them um, and, and that might be more creative thinking about how we break our procurements down. Um, there's always the education and, and ask them do they want to be in our, 
supply chains, maybe some supply tiering or, yeah, yeah. So it's probably not a great answer, but they, yeah, it's difficult, yeah. Yeah. I think uh, we've got time for one more. Um, I'm on the other end, actually. So um, I'm a managing director of an SME in Retrofit. And we've been quite integrated in uh, social value. We've been trading for five years. Our trouble is, is um, a little bit different to what I think your your view. Our issue is, is um, we tend to get programs that are only six months. So if we're working in a certain area, we want to help improve that community. We're working in the southeast, so we could be in Hertfordshire mm. for six months, then we're in Essex. Now the impact we want to have in that community, you know, is very short-lived because uh, although we do improve, um, you know, uh, the communities, we don't have a lasting uh, impact, and that's kind of been our problem. So what we've done is we've looked at our workforce, our own internal supply chain and look at our ways of actually adding social value internally, upskilling yeah. and things like that are of course uh, standard, but what we've been doing is looking at bringing in, not just apprentices, but looking at what you said in your presentation, which was a great presentation, I must say as well, and it was a bit uh, of an eye opener for me. Um, but what we've done is we did look at um, working with the local job centre um, and bring in, uh, we. You know, our office is based in an area where um, unemployment for the under 25 year olds, I think is 90%, wow. right? And uh, so we've been working very closely with the local colleges, local councils, but again, they are all cash strapped. So we've had to almost take um, a bit of that off their shoulders. So we have taken in the last 12 months about 12 interns and uh, apprentices and stuff. But again, it's, uh, changing attitudes which is another problem. Yeah I think you raised a really interesting point there, a number of interesting points. Um, there's one about the, those short time frames which are problematic um, but as procurement folk we often judge and score the service or the goods we're going to get and we need to get better at judging the supplier and their practices as well because there is social value in working with somebody like yourselves um, who inherently give social value and it raises this other tension we have so um, one of my other PhD students has done a PhD looking at like the top-down approach of social value act and what communities need so it comes about when we use framework because everybody wants social value locally in their community but if you zoomed out and said what's best for the country and what's best for social value it actually those boundaries, should, those geographic boundaries shouldn't matter. It doesn't matter where you deliver your social value, that helps everybody in some way, shape or form, but it doesn't feel that way. It doesn't feel that way. Um, so when we bound social value to a locality, it becomes much harder for some suppliers to deliver because they don't know those communities. And again, that goes back to why those public authorities need to take much more leadership in figuring out what outcomes they want and figuring out what those outputs that sit underneath that so a supplier who isn't you know doesn't have the experience in the area or is a new supplier hasn't engaged in it they know what they can do but without it being a tax on the supplier saying we just want more from you that that that's not really in anybody's interest so but there's a, a a really interesting point about how we judge the supplier rather than the supplied goods and services because you in and of themselves bring social value. So we need to get better at trying to figure out how we incorporate that. Just as we would do, we check your financials, we should check your purpose as well. That's, that, I think that's a, that's a great <laughs> point to end on, actually. I think, I think uh, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, Joe, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, uh, for thank your, you. uh, your um, attendance and uh, questions. And Thank you, everybody. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. And uh, I'm sure Joe won't mind you um, grabbing her for further questions uh, now. <laughs>